Hello, welcome to the James Cooley Show. It's your life. I'm your host, Dr. James J.C. Cooley. And wow, we got an absolutely wonderful show coming your way today. You know, Michelle and I uh, just got to uh, a beautiful San Diego. So uh, we're away from that heat in Dallas at the time. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is we got to educate uh, that's going to inspire us that you can be anything that you set your mind to. And just like I always say, if you set your mind to do something, you can't do unless you want to. You have to want to. And she's going to tell us uh, a little bit about herself, her story. And I I'm excited about uh, her new book uh, that uh, she just uh, wrote and released. And you know, I can't wait to get my hands on it so I can read it, so I can continue to get inspired. And so we can all continue to inspire each other. You know, so uh, I'm excited oh, about this, but you know, I can't, I can't even start a show without uh, my uh, exec producer and co-host, mm -hmm. Dr. Michelle Cooley. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, doing great. Have to get adjusted to this whole California time change. <laughs> Two hours just make a difference, audience. It really does. <laughs> Especially when you're getting up in the morning, you're like, why am I getting up so early? It's like, oh, it's two hours in um, Texas, so. Yeah, it makes a difference, but I tell you, it's uh, it feels pretty good here, especially getting up doing the hikes and and seeing all the scenery and and, and other things like that. And so uh, glad to be home, glad to be back home in San Diego, you know. But Michelle, I'm excited about this guest that we got on today. Oh yes, yes, very uh, excited, and um, you know, heard great things about her from. Amy Scruggs. So we're, we're really excited about the show today. How you doing, Amy? I know you're watching. How you doing out there? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Michelle, I want to get this started. Can you please tell our viewers and our listeners uh, the title of the show, the purpose of the show, and introduce this absolutely fantastic guest? Yes, the title of the show is called Saving Summer. So we're getting to have a sit down conversation with acclaimed author, educator, public speaker, and founder of Warrior Publishing, Susie Ryan. We're going to talk about her background as an educator and discuss her book, Saving Summer, and the backstory behind this book, and talk about the mission of Warrior Publishing. So Susie Ryan, after more than 20 years as an award-winning educator, Susie Ryan is now an acclaimed author with her newly released book, Saving Summer, offering a message of hope in this powerful story about overcoming trauma and abuse. Susie is a renowned public speaker and the founder of Warrior Publishing. Please welcome to the show, Susie Ryan. How you doing, Susie? Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. How you doing today? I am so great and I am so honored to be here and I'm so inspired. So thank you so much for having me. We're so happy to have you on, on the show today. And so uh, I know that we're about to get even more inspired. Mm -hmm. uh, about your story. Susie, first of all, can you tell uh, our viewers and our listeners a little bit about you, where you grew up, and what makes you the person that you are today? Mm -hmm. Well, I love the introduction you gave because really what makes me the person I am today is being an educator because I have been an educator for over 20 years. I was in business first, but wanted to go back and be an educator to help at-risk kids so I've taught everything from public school, private school, kindergarten to seniors, but I am very honored to be able to pour into kids' lives and make a change because they're our future. They are our future of tomorrow, and we have to be able to uh, mold them. Uh, the right way and instill the, the right attitude in them uh, so so that they would know that, hey, we got to take life serious. Mm -hmm. We got to continue to grow because uh, our foundation, we have to build our foundation as large as we can so we can continue to build on. So so what what did you grow up at? Uh, so did I, you always, yeah. uh, were you always a San Diego and, or did you grow up somewhere else? Oh, no, I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in Kansas. And that's the setting of the story, Saving Summer. It's small town Kansas in the 60s and 70s. And then I came to San Diego after I graduated from college. But I'm a small town girl at heart. 
And that's the setting of Saving Summer because America's foundation is the small towns across the country. They take care of their own people. And you'll see that in the story, small town Kansas takes care of Summer, who is an at-risk kid. Oh, yeah. And so uh, I, I'm excited to, to learn about that story. Uh, did you have any role models, I'm sure? Uh, you had role models that grow that when you was growing up that you still remember some of the things that they taught you that you live by today. Can you just talk about some of those? Oh, that's that's a that's a great question. Well, one of my role models is my principal now. I uh, I've been, like I said, in private school. Now I'm in public school and now I work at an independent study school where we work with some of the kids that are struggling at their homeschool, their traditional school. So my principal said, and I put this in the book, he says, he says, if you're going to slip through the cracks, you're going to have to slip through my fingers first and I'm going to grab you and not let you be, not let you be slipping through the cracks. So that's Jorge Espinosa. And he's one of my heroes because he loves kids. And this is really my message is we need to love kids. Kids need to know that they are loved. So my students that come in my class, they know that they are loved because I was loved by my teachers, my teachers, and these are my heroes. My teachers, when I was in that small town in Kansas, when I was struggling, they loved me. They took care of me. And you're going to find out in the story, which is true, the story is not, it's a fictionalized story of part of my life and part of my student's life. But you're going to find out that a lot of it today, uh, I'm going to tell you, was true. And, and something happened to me in the story that happened in real life where I was 16 and I was working in a little dairy freeze. And my stepfather came to the dairy freeze. And he told me that I had to leave, get, get out. He kicked me out and told me I was the reason of all the problems that he was having with my mother, which I was an overachiever. I was... I was a track star. I tried to do everything I could to, to feel good about myself because things were so hard at home. And so I had no place to go. I was worried about my math test the next day. I was worried about how I was going to get to my track meet. And now here I am homeless. So what happened was my hero, back to your question, my hero was my math teacher and my track coach. And he, my coach, he came and he helped me and he let me live, JC. I mean, this is this is true. It's in the book, but it's true. He he let me live with his brother and his brother's wife for two years until I went to college. Now that's a hero. That's a hero. That, that is a hero. Uh, that's, that's and that's uh how did you feel? Uh, your stepfather just coming up to you, kicking you out like that. So JC, I had I had this performance-based security because I needed to be loved and I didn't feel loved. So I was everything in school I could be. I was a cheerleader. I was in track. I was in tennis. And it was actually my tennis coach that I lived with. I had a phenomenal track coach too. And I tried so hard to be perfect, which is really a false God. It's, it's not healthy, but it's all I had. So when this stepfather, who was an alcoholic, and he was not a good guy. It's not that he was all bad, but he had his own struggles. But what he did to me was was horrible. And I was I was panicked. I was I was terrified. I I had no I had no money. I think I I think I had 20 cents in my car and I used it to call the payphone because back then back then there were payphones to call two people for help and what 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 to do. But JC I got to live with the most phenomenal people. And as an at-risk kid, I, I overcame the adversity. So think about JC, when I go back and I talk to my students and they have struggles, do you think I understand when they tell me their struggles, right? I get what they're saying. And because I overcame this adversity, then I can tell them that they are victors. They're not victims. They will overcome the adversity that they're going through. And they are loved because my heroes, my teachers loved me. Wow. That, that is so fantastic. You know, Susie, if you had to pick one word to describe you, uh, I'm talking about Susie as a whole, 
what would that adjective be and why? Resilient. Resilient. Because resilience is important. Your attitude of going through the adversity is the key thing and it changes you. And if you can choose to be resilient and know that you're going to be okay. And I know now that, but God made me okay. Now I had no relationship with God growing up, but I always wanted to know him. I always felt him and, and really JC, this very difficult situation of me getting kicked out of the house. I look back and it was as crazy as it sounds. It was a God moment because getting out of that house was really a help to me. So the resilience that God gave me, I just thank God that he made me resilient to tell other people they're going to be okay. They can do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Susan, did you always uh, want to be an educator uh, when you was growing up or did the moment just hit you one day that this is what um, I need to be doing? I wanted to be a business major. So I became a business major. I graduated <clears throat> from high school and went on to the University of Kansas. I lived with that family until I graduated. And then I got in sales and I love sales. I love talking to people, love just talking, selling things. And then a terrible tragedy happened. And my, my brother, and I write about him in the book, but it is fictionalized. He kills himself. And it was so traumatic for me that I went back to selling my, my, my great sales career and it just wasn't enough. So I went back and I got my teaching credential and it took a long time, but I got my teaching credential and I went back and I thought, I'm going to look for at-risk kids because CJC, I was an at-risk kid, but I looked perfect. My brother was an at-risk kid. He didn't look perfect. He struggled. So I can identify kids struggling because they may look perfect, but that's, that's a, like I said, that's, that's not true. You're, you're just overcompensating for what you don't have. So I went back to be an educator and I get to, I get to make a difference. I, I, my, my product now is not, not cameras and makeup. My product is kids, the future of our nation, the future of the world. Kids are the future of the world, and Amen. we have to lead them. We have to lead them. Susan, we have to take a station break, but we're going to come back, and we're going to pick it up, and we're going to continue to talk about saving someone. So if you want to be part of this uh, conversation, regardless of which platform you're on, all you have to do is go to the comments. Ask Susie any question that you might have, and I promise, I promise, I'll get you on. It's your life. Uh, we'll see you shortly after the break. Really get a chance to know who you are. And once you know who you are, you truly know who you are, love who you are. Love who you are. You're a masterpiece. Love who you are. Love who you were born to be. Love, love me some me. That's what I'm talking about. When you leave high school, you gotta know today or tomorrow, or hopefully today, what your plans are. Hopefully, you know, there is no bad decision unless there is no plan. Create, collaborate, commit with confidence. Commit with what? Confidence. Commit with what? Confidence. In everything that you do.
Hello, welcome back to the James Cooley Show. It's your life, and uh, my great, great uh, guest here, Susie Wright. It's we're talking about saving summer. We also talking about her, her being an educator, and we're gonna get off into a lot of other things uh, uh, shortly. And if you want to be part of this conversation, whichever platform you're watching on, was E three six television, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, or over thirty five other live streaming networks. All, all you have to do is just uh, go to the comments and. Become part of the conversation. Hey, Susan. So as an educator, um, were you inspired by any of the other teachers? Because I guess when you first, you know, start teaching yourself, uh, we had to learn ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, some teachers that we kind of gravitate to a lot uh, better than others. And we learn from them. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your experience? Well, I had an experience growing up because of the situation in my family that I didn't get everything that I needed education wise, even though I made good grades, I memorized and forgot and didn't really learn. And then I wanted to be an English teacher. So I didn't have the, I, I didn't have the, the understanding of everything it took. And when I was working at Tri-City Christian School, my first job as an English teacher, there was this woman, Mrs. Burnworth. And she knew everything about English. She knew everything about writing. And I, I learned everything I could from her. I, I was so thankful for her. And she shared, she actually edited Saving Summer. And then through her editing, I learned from her what I was doing wrong so I could go back and teach the kids. So I've had a wealth of, of people, that teachers that I have learned from and Mrs. Burnworth was one. Uh, Suzanne Congleton was another one. Suzanne Congleton is this teacher who is cheerful and energetic and wonderful and makes class fun. And I actually took over for her when she went on maternity leave at, when I moved to Valley Middle School. And I was very blessed to be teacher of the year there and I credit it to Suzanne Congleton who gave me her class, showed me how to set up a class, and then I got to teach Suzanne Congleton's son. So I have had so many amazing teachers. Tina Keating, another one, she just told me this simple statement. It's 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 all about the kids. I mean, we we all know that, but whenever I would be tired or weary or frustrated, I would think, oh no, the kids are the kids are the kids. It's all about the kids. So I've been very blessed to learn from the best. Wow. Were, were there any challenges as 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 you uh, became more seasoned and learned the games of uh, teaching and you know, especially with lesson plans and and all of those type of things? It's the most humbling job I've had except motherhood, <laughs> motherhood, <laughs> motherhood, but it's the most rewarding job I've had. Um, I did have the challenges that I had, the lesson plans, all of that's a, a lot of work. Once I got into the classroom and could be with the kids, it inspired me, but there were some difficult kids that would act out and they were really at risk kids. The kids that act out are acting out for a reason. And, and one particular student just pushed me every way. I, 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 I'm, this was when I was teaching seventh grade. And I remember thinking, how, how am I going to get to this? How am I going to reach this kid? So what I did, and this is the secret, I started praying for him specifically. And as I prayed for him, the, the acting out became not personal, but it became a ministry to love that kid, to know that that kid, I just wanted that kid to know I didn't appreciate the behavior, but I loved him. And then he was able to relax and start learning. That's my secret is loving the kids. Wow. I want to switch the topic because I want to start talking about uh, saving summer. You know, first of all, can you tell our viewers and listeners, so uh, 
how did you, how did that come to thought and why did you write that book? And I think you said it was a period piece. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a seventies piece. Well, okay. I do have a question for you, if I can, because okay. I like cheerfulness and I like fun. And the story is about com overcoming adversity, and it's based on suffering that I suffered, and I saw my students. But I wanted to put in some 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 part of my life that was really a, really a, a blessing for me. So I was I put in an iconic singer of the fifties, sixties and a little bit the 70s. And I got, it became a key part of the book. And I got this person's lyrics, him, it's a he, his person's lyrics. Do you have a guess who that might be? The iconic 60s, he drove Cadillacs. He was, he was the king. Elvis. Elvis, Elvis. <laughs> so I was so blessed to see Elvis in concert at 13. Can you imagine I got to see him in concert? And my mom played his songs all the time. And so, and, and his voice, of course, is so soothing and it's just such a comfort to me. So I was very thankful that I put his lyrics in and got his lyrics. So I thought when you have Elvis in your book, it's going to be a bestseller, right? Saving Summer is going to be great because I have Elvis. So I wanted to make it cheerful and fun and, and a positive experience, but it really is about suffering and overcoming adversity. And so I used things in my life that were difficult and that my students had told me. One student told me that her mother chose drugs and alcohol over her. And I thought, oh my goodness, that was so, so rough to hear. So I put in the stories of pain and suffering, but as we overcome the adversity, that pain and suffering can be used for good. I also put in a, a student of mine, wrote him into the book, Jack Monday's his name. And he tragically got into a car right at the first of COVID with about six other kids in the middle of the night and two blocks from his house. Unfortunately, he died. He was the only student who died. But at his vigil, his mom said, keep my, keep my Jack's memory alive. So I wrote him into the book in a scene with my brother, and the book is actually dedicated to Bart Bradford and Jack Monday. And the dedication, I've memorized it, goes, Saving Summer is dedicated to and written for Bart Bradford and Jack Monday. Shakespeare said it best, good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. You two are missed every day on this earth. I dedicated that book to Jack and Bart, and that's what kept me going. And you've written so many books, and you know it's not for the faint of heart. That kept me going that I'm keeping their memory alive, keeping their memory alive. And Jack's accident, actually, in the book Saving Summer, that happened to me. I did get into a car in the middle of the night, two block, not two blocks from the house, but two miles from the house. She flips the car, and it's totally crushed everything's crushed in this truck and we walk out of it without a scratch now unfortunately jack didn't walk out of it but i walked out of it so it's jack's life's paralleled mine and it was such an honor to write about him and keep him alive so that was my goal wow so uh, a lot of the stuff i know you said it's a, a fiction a lot of the stuff that's in there is uh, if I got this correctly, it mirrors some of the things that you was feeling or some of the things that happened in your life as well. That's so that's so wise of you, just how you put that. That's exactly right. And as I wrote it, I healed from the trauma that I had. And then I could offer it as a bridge of hope for my students because we all need a bridge of hope. We all suffer. And I always wanted to tell my story in a fictional form and the stories my students told me, and then to keep Jack's memory alive and keep my brother's memory alive. It's been, it's been a, 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 a honor, honor to write it. Have you received feedback? Uh, lots of feedback on the book already. I've received feedback from people that have read it. The people that have read it, they, they have felt 
inspired and inspired to look at their own life and what they've suffered because it is a redemptive book because in the end, and I don't want to give too much away, but in the end, it's a story of redemption. It's a restore. It's a story of, but God, but God is the star of the show. So it, even though it's tough to get through parts because it's painful, the end you're cheering, you're cheering. And that's my kind of story. That's my kind of story. Cause that's my life. My life has been one of being redeemed and the hard things being used for good. And you know what I tell you, and that's what we have to do. We have to, uh, sometimes we're going to be faced with challenges, trials mm -hmm. and tribulation, but I try, I try to see the good in everything. I try to see the light in everything mm -hmm. because if you are stuck in the dark and you're not trying to find the light, um, First of all, you're not going to be able to help yourself. Secondly, you certainly won't be able to help anyone else mm -hmm. uh, and lead them to the light. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, and I and I see that you do that. And I'm inspired by you and inspired by the attitude and how important your attitude is as you lead people to, to the light. Because we've all had situations that are dark, right? And And we need beacons of light, bearers of the light that show that this will be used for good, but it's based on what you do with it. It's based on your attitude. It's also based on your ability to forgive. I think that is a key point and part of the book and life. We have to, we have to choose to forgive so we can have the light, so we can pour the light into other people. And I'm not saying things are easy and I'm not saying it's easy to forgive, but is it a choice to release ourselves from the darkness of others when we choose to forgive. And that is my goal. And the book shows that the book shows the only answer is forgiving and then letting the light come in so we can show people the light and out of the darkness. Forgiveness. Sometimes uh, many think it's tough, but oh. uh, I believe that once you forgive, I mean, I can remember a time or two in my life where, I was angry mm -hmm. and I did not want to forgive. I wanted to hold that grudge and blame everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it's easier to forgive and let all of that pain and all of that suffering go when you truly forgive uh, someone. Well, when you do that, then you release that darkness from yourself. And I like to say, and we know this, Hurt people hurt other people, but free people, they free other people. And when we release others for the injustice that they've done to us, then we are free then to use it all for good. And we're free to be the people that we were called to be, which is to make a difference and pour into other people and to be able to use our circumstances for good. I feel like when our circumstances are used for good, it redeems it. It redeems everything that has happened. And what the enemy meant for evil, God always uses for good. And that's the redemptive piece. That's what the world needs. That's what students need. That JC, that's what my students need when they come in to class hurting. They need to know they're going to be okay. And they can make this part of their destiny. I, I love I, I I love using what's difficult for good. It's it makes it somehow somehow redeemable, and that's the story of life. And that is the story of life. We gotta take a station break right here, uh, but we're gonna come back. We're gonna pick it up, and we are going to continue to talk about saving summer, and uh, we're gonna talk about. Uh, Oh, the Warriors Publishing Company. We're, we're going to talk about a lot of things. So stay tuned. If you want to be part of the conversation, just go to the uh, comments on whichever platform you're watching this on and just put your question in. I promise you we'll get your next. It's your life. And we'll be back shortly after the break. Drunk to 
Hello, welcome back to your life. And uh, Susie is wow, educator, so inspiring. Uh, you know, so uh, just uh, you can just tell the love, special love for her, her children, uh, the teacher, the the ones that she teach, and and uh, you can just feel it when she talk. You know, so uh, I tell you, if you want to be part of the conversation, join us, join us, and ask her any questions that you might have. Hey, Susie. Uh, were there any challenges uh, in writing this book? I mean, I, you're right, I have written uh, several, and there are always, I guess you get the writers, uh, at least me, where you have that little spot where you just, just freeze for a little bit. Uh, did you ever uh, uh, experience that? I did. I did. And it was difficult because I was teaching all day and I'd come and write at night. So if I had that, I would be, oh, I don't have time. I got to I gotta keep writing because I got to get to bed because I have to get up. But what I did is I kept a hand towel next to the computer because as I was writing this, I had a picture of my brother, Bart, right over the computer. I was so inspired when I was writing. I felt his spirit. I felt his love. I felt his just cheering me on. You can do this. You can do this. You can do this. Oh, it makes me teary. And that inspired me out of every writing block I had. Every writing block because I felt like I was telling his story. And even though it's fictionalized, and I was keeping his memory alive. And that was what I felt I was called to do. So I got through those writer's blocks. And what I did was I would not be discouraged. I would decide to write 20 minutes a night, no matter what. And then if I could go longer, I would. And sometimes I went hours way late in the night and then I'd have to get up in the morning and I'd be so tired teaching, but I, I made a commitment to write. And then pretty soon it took shape. It took shape, but I, I was so excited to keep my brother his memory alive and Jack's memory alive. And it was like, they were pulling me JC. They were pulling me into this book and, and helping me. They were my cheerleaders. They were cheerleaders for me. Wow. And so you felt that spirit around you and uh, mm. it kind of gave you the, uh, the encouragement to continue to do what you're doing. And, and also so my students did because I don't, um, I, I don't say this is because I had trauma growing up, but we learn as a teacher, we go to our classes and we learn that intense trauma as kids can cause unexplained heart issues and unexplained physical issues growing up. And when I, JC, I, I, this motivated me to write the book too, to help kids not have trauma or identify their trauma to get past their trauma because I was in class seven years ago teaching. I was teaching my students in the seventh grade. I was a, it was a poetry cafe and I did not know it JC, but at the time I suffered a heart attack in my class. Can you imagine, can you imagine you're on public, you're on the, you, you've done so many you know, public appearances and, and you do this. I'm, I'm in my class and I, there's a TV on my chest. And I feel like I'm going to throw up. I feel like I'm going to get sick. I'm hot. I'm cold. And my poet's speaking. And I say, oh, I'm going to take a little break and I'm and get some more food because I had a big food buffet. And because I'm an Ironman, which is a gnarly triathlete, it's, it's you know, you I don't know if you know this, you swim 2.4 miles. It's, it's just crazy, actually. You swim 2.4 miles. You do 112 on the bike and just for fun. You jump in your running shoes and you run a marathon. So I thought, I can't not be having a heart attack. I'm an Ironman. So, but I was, and I didn't know it. And I had two more. And because I didn't know it, they just, they just kept getting worse. Now you're probably thinking, why didn't you go to the ER? Why, why didn't you go to the urgent care? Unfortunately, women don't. And the number one cause of death in America for women is heart problems. So I was the classic example of the woman who thought, oh, this can't be happening to me. But I did have a heart attack, three heart attacks. I went to the urgent care finally. 
and my cardiologist, brilliant Dr. Kenneth Carr, he was very careful because he knew something was different because it still wasn't showing I had had anything wrong because my strong heart from all the exercise was keeping my heart beating. But my main artery from a SCAD event, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, shredded my main artery, which is my LAD, which is the Widowmaker's artery. Now, if you have a shredded artery, you're in bad shape. You're going to die because you can't get blood to the heart. So you're thinking, oh my gosh, what did he do? If my cardiologist, Dr. Carr, would have ballooned me, it would have shredded everything because I had no plaque. If he would have sent me home when he couldn't find anything, I would have died. But he put three extra long stents into my artery and I was able to live. But then when I went back to school and the students are like, oh my gosh, Mrs. Ryan, I was then ready to write my book. I was ready to make a difference because God had given me extra time to live, right? And I'm like, okay, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make a difference. I am going to write my book. I'm going to use every single minute I can with my life that I've been given to change the world. Wow. You just, you just sent me somewhere. <laughs> um, how do you feel now? I mean, how long ago uh, or since uh, these heart attacks? Well, it's a great question. And I attribute it all to God because the three stents took now it's really wild because you wake up during the surgery and it's, you go into the cath lab, they go in through an art, you know, in a vein and, and they, they, it's, it's really tricky. So I was awake through part of it. And I was awake when Dr. Carr said, it's not taking. And so he's putting a stint in my LAD and I see my heart on the, the beating. And so I'm praying, Jesus, heal my heart. Jesus, heal my heart. Jesus, heal my heart. I go back out. I wake up again and he has no emotion in his voice. And I hear him say again, it's not taking. So he's putting another stint and he has to get past the unraveling and the shredding in my LAD in my artery. And I hear him say, it's not taking. So I'm praying again, Jesus, heal my heart. Jesus, heal my heart. I go back out. I wake up a third time. And this is the only time that I, the times I've woken up and I hear him say it is taken. So it got past the shredding. And then my heart was completely healed. How, how can that be? I went a week and uh, with having three heart attacks, not getting into the ER, which is my message now is if you have something funny, you run. No, don't run to the ER. You have someone take you to the ER. You don't don't mess around with that. But I didn't do that. And I still got to live and my heart completely healed. Miracle. Wow. How has those experiences changed your life? It's almost a privilege to have a near-death experience because you know how short life is. You know your days are numbered. Teach me to number my days so I live a life of wisdom, right? You know your days are numbered. You know there's more to this life. And I have tried to right every wrong, apologize to everyone, to be the best version of myself. To stick up for myself, though, when sometimes I let people treat me poorly, to forgive fast, forgive fast, love fiercely, because I got another chance. I got to see my three children get married. I got to see my three children get married. Wow. Who, who, this, who, this who, is yeah. This is fascinating. Um, I'm going to take a station break, but I'm going to come back and I want to pick it up from there. Uh, because uh, I want to talk uh, to you a little bit more about you had an opportunity and how you felt when you saw your three kids get married and said, I probably probably shouldn't be here because of that near-death experience. So I want to pick it up there when we get back. But it's your life, and if you want to be part of this conversation, you might as well join us in because uh, this is fascinating. We'll see you shortly after the break.
Noah Dingley here, producer of The James Cooley Show, It's Your Life. And the new audio version of James' book, Country Boy, City Boy, A Journey That Ain't Over Yet, is a must-have. James shares his true life story of struggle and success in America. It's both a cautionary tale and a roadmap to achieving the American dream. Get the new audio version of Country Boy, City Boy, A Journey That Ain't Over Yet by James Cooley on Amazon.com or wherever audiobooks are sold. Hello. Hey, I'm James Cooley. I am the founder and CEO of the J.C. Cooley Foundation, Options Opportunity Slash Choice Program. Our primary mission is to help build the foundation of our youth and young adults and communities. And we encourage everyone to dream big, think big, and be big at everything you do. And the way that you do that is, first of all, you got to believe in yourself. You have to believe in yourself. You have to know that you are here for a purpose. You also have to be able to step out your comfort zone and do things that you that you probably didn't think that you can do. Hello, welcome back to the James Cooley Show, It's Your Life. And wow, this uh, last segment, uh, it, it was touchy. I was, I was just inspired uh, about Susan telling her story, especially with the three heart attacks and, and being able to uh, survive those and and uh, see her three kids get married. You know, So I want to pick it up there, Susan. But first of all, I have to uh, put a plug in about my my new book. So JC, I, I think you're plugging your book. So, but it shows that I'm talking. So I will just, um, oh, there you go. You know, a, a black man poem, Remind Body and Soul uh, is a bestseller, number one bestseller, number one release. And I tell you, uh, this, uh, I, it's, I'm shocked uh, that it's uh, doing so well. Mm. And uh, the story, Black Man Point of Mind, Body, and Soul, is about um, uh, what goes on in many uh, African American men mm. uh, when they're growing up because of colonization, slavery, and all the things and trials and tribulations that uh, they experience in life. But the book is really it's, um, a source of relief, and it's all about forgiveness forgiveness of all the things that have happened to us in the past and let, being able to let that go and this roadmap to happiness and reaching out and joy because love comes between everybody black white pink gold and purple so mm. you can pick up my book at amazon barnes and noble or anywhere where books are so my a black man point of your mind body and so what a message what a message and and it's your cheerful message and your life and what you've done you're such an inspiration i would i would teach that book and i just might teach that in my <clears throat> high school class i'm always looking for heroes to teach that have overcome adversity and that's my kind of book hey, thank you thank you and you know i would love to uh, speak at your class one of your days if uh, if i was uh, oh. Uh, oh. invited yeah well that would be fantastic because we live close <laughs> Oh, yeah, that'd be marvelous. That's a date. We'll do it. We'll put that together. We'll put you know, that together. I want to pick it back up because uh, you touched my heart. Um, and you've been touching my heart this this whole uh, uh, interview. But uh, being able to overcome mm -hmm. such a tragedy or experience and just thanking God, because God is the glory, thanking God at everything. And um, we ask God to give us a chance to see our kids grow, get married, uh, grandkids, mm -hmm. and all of those fantastic things. And uh, you were saying uh, toward the end of the last segment that uh, God made sure that he kept you here to see your kids get married and potentially grandkids and great grandkids. Uh, can, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I can. And I got emotional the, the last segment because I thought about the privilege of being able to see them. 
And when you're on the table and they're, you're being operated on, and I don't even understand all of that. I just saw the heart beating. I, I was fighting for my life. I was praying for my life because I knew I had work still to do and work as a teacher, but work as a mother. <clears throat> and I knew how hard it would be for my kids to not have me. And when, when I went into this event, um, when I had this third heart attack, I didn't know they were heart attacks. Now, I should have known something. But again, I thought, I'm an Iron Man. This is dehydration or something. So I told all of them not to come to the hospital. My husband was there and my sister was there. But I said, oh, no, uh, my son's in the Navy <clears throat> and he was over in South Korea. I said, oh, no, this is I'm good. You know, mom, she's healthy. I'm good. This is just some really weird thing going on. And my other son <clears throat> was in L.A. on business and he was going to come down to San Diego. And I'm like, oh, no, no, mom's great. And my daughter was at school and I said, no, no, it's good. So I thought about if I would have died and they didn't even get to be at the hospital and how I, I just remember thinking, I can't die. I, I can't. No, God, I, I have things I got to do. <laughs> I, 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 and then to be able to live and realize how severe it was, I realized that I have a message and, and the message is forgiveness and resilience and overcoming adversity, but it's also take care of yourself. When you have something that doesn't feel right, it's probably not. Go get it checked out. Dr. Carr told me that, I, I guess they choose who they have in the urgent care. He told me my case was so bizarre, he called it bad luck because there's no rhyme or reason for it. They don't know what causes it. He told me it was so, so interesting that nothing seemed to make sense that he specifically chose me. Well, I know that was God. I know that was God putting in Dr. Carr, my brilliant cardiologist, putting in his heart. You have to take this girl because she's got some problems here that only you can figure out who I'm so thankful. So I feel God's fingerprints over all of it, saving my life. And I want to give back to him. And I want to be thankful every day for another day. Just like you said, to even have breath that we have, to even have free air to breathe, to even wake up in the morning. I So when I teach school, we, we start about what we're thankful for. We put it on the board. We're thankful for clean water. We're thankful for the air. We're thankful we got up. We're thankful we had breakfast. Or if we don't have breakfast, I always bring snacks. So Mrs. Ryan always has food, right? We're thankful. And I am thankful that I got to still be a mom and a wife. And my life didn't end. And it makes me emotional. And it motivated me. You remember, I lost my brother when he was young. And I got to live. And then I got to keep his memory alive. So I'm on a mission here. I'm on a mission to love people. <laughs> wow. We are thankful that you are here. I'm talking about not, not just for the show, but you're here changing lives, educating, inspiring others. What a gift from God uh, mm -hmm. to be able to do that. And uh, I, I want to personally uh, thank you and tell you that you're loved and appreciated. Oh, it's so sweet. <laughs> so isn't it interesting? I didn't feel loved as a kid. And, and again, I forgive, I forgive my parents. They had their own struggles. I forgive them. But God, but God, the prophet Jeremiah says, but God has brought so many people in my life to love me. I feel so loved. I am over, my cup overflows with love, right? And, and I have so much thankfulness. And then I can go back and I can love those kids. I can love them when they don't feel loved. I can say, you're going to be okay. You're, you're, the trauma is going to be triumph. I have a ministry, just loving kids. And you know what? That's my message. We need to love people just like you're doing. We need to love them. We're down to about the last two, two and a half minutes of the show. I want to talk about uh, you being the founder of Warrior Publications. Can you tell our viewers and listeners a little bit about that? Yes, I can. So I started Warrior Publishing and Warrior Publishing is looking for authors that have overcome adversity and who are willing to work hard 
because you and I both know writing a book is not easy. People think, oh, I want to write a book. And I do think everyone has a story, but I'm not sure everyone knows what it takes to write a book. And it is a lot of work. You have to be a warrior <laughs> to write a book. Do I speak truth? Do I speak truth? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you, you, you know. And so my goal is at my goal is to take other people's stories and show them what I've learned about writing and help them bring their story of redemption and overcoming adversity to the world because the world needs more warrior stories. That's what we need. That's why I'm excited about your book. Uh, that, that's just my kind of book. This is what I'm talking about. Warriors in education, warriors in the military, warriors, war, mom warriors. I mean, moms are the biggest warriors, health warriors, PS, you know, uh, PTSD warriors. I know that we are changed by people's stories. That's what changes a heart, one heart at a time. When we tell our stories, our stories change people. Wow. How can our, our viewers and listeners get in touch with you? How can they get your book? Tell them, tell them what, they, what they can buy your book at. They can go to suzyryan.com, S-U-Z-Y-R-Y-A-N.com. And it's also available, available on Amazon. And it's also available at Barnes & Noble. So suzyryan.com. Susie Ryan. And Susie, uh, can you give our, our viewers a, one quick takeaway, 30 seconds or less, uh, I'll just give them a takeaway from the book, from this interview and uh, uh, you. My takeaway is forgive, forgive fast. Don't let other people's darkness touch you. The world is dark. The world, the world needs light. You be the light, you forgive. You forgive fast and love fiercely and change the world one heart at a time. Susie, I wanna thank you so much for taking the time to come on the James Cooley show. It's your life. It's been an absolute pleasure. You know, my so honor, my honor. I, I like to thank uh, Dr. Michelle Cooley for putting together another absolutely fantastic show. Uh, I like to thank Amy Scrubs, uh, my, my good friend, Amy, for sending you our way. Uh, but most importantly, I'd like to thank our viewers and the audience for tuning in to the James Cooley show. It's your life daily. I always dream big, think big and be big. And we'll be back tomorrow. Same time. Same place. It's your life. We'll see you then.